Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of Craig Heron's talk, Labor on the March, 150 Years of Labor Parades in Toronto. It is part of the 2011 History Matters Lecture Series, sponsored by the Toronto Public Library and the History Education Network. Please check back on ActiveHistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the 2011 History Matters Lecture Series. First thing I want to do is ask for some audience participation. What's this? No. Does anyone know? There's some police. There's the G8. And that's the Occupy Toronto. It's Occupy Toronto about two weeks ago when they decided on one particular day that they would move from 1st Bay Street, where they did some things outside the design exchange, then they went to the middle of Dundas and, and Young, outside the Eden Center, to form this big 99 on the road that was visible from above. The whole point was they knew there were traffic helicopters above, there were uh, media helicopters above. And 99, of course, is what the whole protest is about, the 1%, the 99%. Now, I'm doing that, I'm showing you that partly to remind you that when people move through the streets, they're not just there to have a good time or, or entertain, they're usually trying to communicate something. In this case, it was quite bold, in the middle of a street doing it, but there's, what I'm going to be talking about tonight in a lot of ways is how parades were an early and extremely important form of mass communication. And that that was a way in which labor eventually decided it could make a major contribution to getting itself uh, accepted and respected in society by participating in those kind of public events. So that's the first thing to understand about parades, that they're more than just entertainment. They're also communication processes, trying to convey different kinds of meaning, to make us think about the paraders themselves and about the message they're trying to get across, the issues that animate them in the particular way they're presenting them. A parade has always been, like this is, a performance of some kind or other, something to bear in mind. It has a theatrical element to it, with many elements uh, to it that marchers hoped would make an impression on their fellow townsfolk. And of course, it's a way of communicating that goes a long way back in history. It predates mass communication of any other kind, going back centuries, and it's been the most effective form of mass communication amongst people who either didn't read or didn't read very much. It was a way of implanting messages in a visual way that would uh, hit a lot of people at one time. Parades have also been a way of using public space. They developed in cities and towns where people didn't, lo didn't live far apart and where no one was too far from the center of town and where there was not a lot of distance between the, the public and the private in public and private spaces, where doors of households opened out onto streets uh, with a busy street life of working and shopping and chatting and gossiping, of singing and dancing, of courtship and fighting, all sorts of things going on in a public sphere that people understood as being part, very much a part of the rhythm of their daily lives. Life was lived in the streets, almost always on foot. And so historians have taken to talking about the walking city, in other words, in which people would actually uh, assume that they're going to move around on, on uh, their own two feet. Two days ago, no, yesterday, I was lecturing to an undergraduate class and des describing the, the emergence of the tramp in 19th century uh, North America. And they were, literally, I could see their jaws dropping, and I said, you know, what they did, the reason they were called that is they would walk from here to Detroit. And if they couldn't find a job there, they would walk to Chicago. If they couldn't find one there, they'd walk back to Cleveland. Walking was a way of life in ways that we now try and do as exercise, but it was just part of the daily life. So what I'm talking about initially is a cultural form, this parade, this tradition, set of traditions of parading, that develops in a world in which people are close together, they're on foot, and they're gathered together easily to, uh, for uh, all sorts of, of reasons. So 150 years ago, to take an easy, I gave that as a very rough kind of uh, uh, ballpark starting point, there were parades of almost every imaginable kind by almost every imaginable group. Almost every week, one or other would pass your front door. It could be a funeral procession. It could be a group of actors who were promoting a play that they were putting on downtown, or you know, some other part of the town. It could be a uh, drunken gaggle of baseball friends, fans celebrating their, 
team's victory, all marching in some kind of orderly, uh, symbolic way to convey through the middle of the streets to convey a kind of performance for the spectators on the sidewalks. Occasionally, a group of workers might do this kind of parade, the more informal, small-scale stuff. It might, for example, be like 1852, when the tailors of Toronto first discovered this dreadful thing called a sewing machine. What a horror this would be for the, sew, for the, the uh, clothing industry. And therefore, they had a ritual burial of marching the sewing machine through the city, ritual funeral, I'm sorry, marching the sewing machine through the city and then burying it in a coffin. This would be the end of, of the, the dangers to their craft. Well, needless to say, within a few years, they'd all learned to use a sewing machine. Not unlike what people thought of computers in the 1970s. There was, of course, another kind of group activity on the street that um, I won't be saying so much about tonight. And at the time, they were usually referred to as mobs, and they were engaged in what people like to call riots. And they were invariably some kind of protest involving a large number of people who wanted immediate results. The crowd would form fairly quickly with no prior organization, and they'd be quite noisy, and they'd get, sometimes get violent, but they were actually pretty organized and pretty controlled in what they were doing, and they usually had very specific targets they went after. It wasn't just wild mayhem like we've recently seen in Vancouver. Um, they often used some theatrical elements as well, like uh, burning an effigy was a very common way of making uh, whoever they were upset about feel badly. Um, sometimes strike activity took this form in the 19th century. Quite often it did. And one of the things that the new unions that I'll be talking about try to do is to tame this, to turn it from the disorder that it is into something we now call picket lines that are much more orderly and actually move in an orderly way in front of a workplace and avoid the risk of potentially having the troops come down on you and being thrown into jail, which is what often happened in these circumstances. So tonight I'm going to concentrate not on these more spontaneous, chaotic, although ultimately very colorful and fascinating activities, but more on the formal, more ritualized forms of marching around town. A lot of parades were actually quite large and well organized. Sometimes they were part of big civic events like the Queen's Birthday Celebration in 1854. If you aren't aware of it, the Victoria Day of the 24th of May was called the Queen's Birthday until the end of the 19th century, and it was celebrated always on that day. Um, thereafter. It was also after the, when it became Victoria Bay, they still thought they should celebrate the 24th of May as the monarch's birthday whenever the monarch was born. But at any rate, what this shows us in a pretty vague way is the number of uh, people, uh, groups participating in a parade that's moving across in front of, the, of uh, a viewing stand that includes some military, some um, uh, ethnic societies that each have their own banners, fire companies, military bands, and so on. Well, more often, one particular, those were big things that drew together a number of different parts of the population. More often, particular groups organized to put on their display for the rest of the town, rather than trying to represent the whole town. Yeah? Are these pictures from Toronto? They're all from Toronto, yeah. The last one was in front of the old government house, which has long since been torn down. Uh, this one... I actually don't remember. Probably King Street. Um, part of the problem is in the 19th century pictures, a lot of the buildings you see in the background are long since gone, so I'm trying to identify them. But no, that was one of my criteria tonight. <laughs> I tried to make sure I have Toronto pictures. Um, so the military in many ways set the pace with uniforms, with uh, very rigid styles of marching, with their horses, their artillery, and so on. Um, but there were also marches by fraternal societies, like these odd fellows who usually uh, took over the, uh, the celebrations of Dominion Day. That was their favorite day to, to parade. Um, Saint, uh, uh, the Orange Order, the big 19th century, uh, one of the biggest 19th century fraternal orders, which continued, of course, of course, on into the 20th century. This is the early 20th century with a bunch of the women and children who are noticeably not walking in the streets. Hold on to that. I'm coming back to it. But notice that they're riding in a wagon. St. Patrick's Day, that's a bit later than the 19th century, but it's an indication of, them, uh, of the parades that went way back in the 19th century. 
But some religious processions, actually, some uh, ethnic and religious processions got very nasty. In the 1860s and 70s, the or orange and green, the, the Protestant and Catholic wings of the, of the um, Irish community would go at each other in the streets as they tried to march through each other's communities to establish their, their right to be there and to put the other one in some kind of uh, position of subordination. And, and in this case, there's real fist fighting and uh, clubs and whatnot. And of course, the Salvation Army comes along as one of the, the religious groups that are marching in the street. Before that, the Catholics, the Anglicans, and many others would have religious associations, but the Salian brings its own kind of parading tradition that it picks up on them, the marching band, and in contrast to most others, actually has women marching right there in the street <coughs> along with the men. And of course, reform organizations that included amongst others, <coughs> the Women's Christian Temperance Union that dates from 1877. So, and, and political parties would, would have uh, special celebrations and so on. But let's go back to this Orange Parade because I think it's a useful one for us to look at to see some of the basic elements of it. There's something uh, central about this that is modeled on the military. The way in which they organize themselves in, in carefully uh, structured rows, they are, it's all very orderly. They have a, usually, although you can't see it here, they usually have a Union Jack at the front. They have a marshal riding a horse who's symbolically supposed to be controlling them, and usually some sub marshals along the way. And um, music that uh, is played by marching bands to which the men are supposed to be keeping uh, pace as they march along. Something has definitely changed in current Labor Day parades. Um, and the, the tone of all of this is respectability and masculinity. There are no women in this parade. And if there are, there, there, if, I don't know whether there are any in this particular parade, but if the Orange Order puts any in, they're in the form that we just saw. They're in a carriage, appropriately looked after by their men, rather than walking loosely. Because this is part of the way in which men run public life. And women are not supposed to be in public life. They don't have the vote at this point. They're supposed to be at home running, uh, keeping the fire going, looking after the kids, and making sure that everything is well and, and looked after, so that this is a very male environment. They also have banners, of course. And that becomes one of the main forms of communication that's going on, aside from the actual formation that's trying to suggest the respectability of these people marching down the street. They also have banners that will convey some meaning about the particular group that's passing through. I won't dwell on what King Billy was actually supposed to have done. But some of the paraphernalia they wear is very important for labor um, movement activity as well. The sash and some kind of ribbon that would be hanging on as well. These are standard uh, paraphernalia that you would find in, in the parades of fraternal societies and in, in, um, other organizations that want to mimic that kind of um, activity, sashes, badges, and whatnot. So this was the set of parading traditions, if you like, that the first labor movement encountered when it decided it too had something to communicate. The first workers' organizations emerged in the second half of the 19th century, mostly in the form of the craft union. In other words, skilled working men who came together on the basis of a particularly valuable skill that they were able to convince others they had. They had their own parading tradition that they added on to what I've just been talking about. They took a great deal from, what, from the formal culture of the mainstream, but they added in some, some elements that had been developed in Europe by the, cra the craft guilds of the, uh, the, the medieval and renaissance period becoming right up into the present. So that by the time we're having the first evidence of this in North America, we're commonly seeing St. Crispin riding a horse. For the, when, he's, when it's the boot and shoemakers, the patron saint of boot and shoemakers. We might see some reference to Tubal Cain, who was the biblical figure who supposedly founded the art of, of molding in foundries. Um, I don't know how they proved that, but they like to, to say so. And they, those groups would have their own banners, like the orange banner I just saw, that would present the particular patron saint or the particular craft. This is a very old tradition. You can see those banners in Britain and France and Italy and so on that go way back um, three, four centuries. In North America, this, when these uh, kinds of groups began to parade, they were most often called trades possession, trades possession, oh boy, processions. 
Um, trades per sessions. And I haven't actually uh, found any record of when the first trades possession procession appeared in Toronto. But what is most interesting is that in 1872, we do know that the emerging labor movement of the period took the form of the trade procession and turned it to their own purposes. Instead of attacking themselves, uh, tacking themselves onto a formal civic procession, now they're marching on their own for their own purposes. And that purpose was a nine-hour working day. Across this southern Ontario region, there were a number of nine hours leagues that were formed. And a major strike, at the center of which was George Brown, one of the fathers of Confederation, uh, in an attempt to break the strike, uh, was fought by the printers of Toronto to try and get the nine hour day. And in the midst of that, the Toronto unions got together and marched and uh, formed one of their first political trade processions. Um, we don't have any pictures of that, we do have good descriptions of it, but in Hamilton, a month later, this is what it looked like. So we can pretty well assume that that was the kind of thing that happened in Toronto. Same kind of banners, the same kind of careful, respectable looking men marching through the center of the city and trying to establish uh, the dignity of labor in the, in the midst of uh, an attack on it. Now, I will only say in passing that quite regularly the Toronto labor movement likes to count this as the first Labor Day. And it's not. This is a, a political protest that happens in which the, the labor parading tradition is first most visible. But Labor Day doesn't come for another 10 years. In fact, exactly 10 years. In the summer of 1882, as uh, we were already told. <laughs> um, now, interestingly, New York City has always claimed that they were first in September of 1882, but actually a few weeks earlier in July, the Toronto workers had already been in the streets. And in fact, they had invited the guy who organized the New York one to come and speak at their event, but he was sick, or his wife was sick and he didn't make it. But uh, strictly speaking, we beat them. Uh, at least the, the, the one that's usually seen as, the, uh, as the, the pioneer. And what's important about this, this event is that it sets in motion a tradition. A tradition that says there should be a day it is a holiday, but also in which there is a public celebration of the dignity and value of labor. And in 1882, all they had was the city council giving them some gentle support for that. And Twelve years later, they finally convinced, after many cities had already been running these for uh, several years, they finally convinced the federal government to introduce it as a national holiday, and it becomes the Labor Day that we now know. That's interestingly, you know, if you stop to think about it, this is the only social group that have got its own national holiday. If you stop to think of it, all the others are religious holidays or big, you know, uh, Dominion Day or it became Canada Day or Victoria Day, but this is the only group which suggests how important labor had become by the end of the 19th century. Yeah? Well, there's a, at that time, the bank still closed. Ah, good point. I never understood why the bank is closed on labor. One of the things I've discovered, that my next book is going to be about uh, how work and leisure got defined, and, and the public holiday is one of the things I'm interested in, it's the eight-hour day and other things. Um, but because the public holiday is declared, usually at a point at which it's already being recognized, it's, I mean, it's made into law, usually at a point when it's been recognized, but it has no enforcement provisions in it whatsoever. So banks can stay open, st stores can stay open. All they've got on them is community pressure that says you shouldn't stay, you shouldn't stay open. It wouldn't be until, as far as I've sorted out so far, it wouldn't be until after the Second World War that those laws were actually altered so that you can actually prosecute someone for opening on well, a public holiday. But um, the, the, the newspapers, which, as I'll say in a second, were all over this, they really loved Labor Day, they loved to report it, would um, tell you which stores were open. And sometimes the ads would tell you, we're, go we're open till noon, but then you can go and watch the parade, right, or something like that. Uh, but there was a lot of looseness around it, and some, clearly some transportation workers on the docks and on the, trail, on the railways never had Labor Day off. They just kept working. Um, all over the country, local labor councils pulled together the unions in their particular town or city to put on a show on Labor Day. There was never any central coordination from one central point in Canada, but it's amazing how similar these all looked across the country. And that's one of the things that Steve and I were really struck by when we did the book, that 
as you went from city to city. It's all locally organized, very decentralized, and yet they had a model in their heads of what they wanted. So what I'm talking about about Toronto really had resonance all over the place. From the beginning, Toronto workers made, a, made their parade the centerpiece of the day. There were other events, there were sporting events, uh, often at the, by, after 1895 at the CNE, um, but they were most interested in getting this big parade up on the streets for people to, to uh, look at. The Labour Council coordinated the overall event, but individual unions would organize their own contingent, decide what to put in. Yep. Um, I noticed Labour doesn't have a U in it. Is oh, I wondered when someone would start asking <laughs> that. <laughs> In the night, in, I, I'm not actually sure when the, it changed, but all newspapers, all public organizations in the uh, civil society, as opposed to government, used OR. It was widely used in the late 19th through the first half of the 20th century. Uh, the Trades and Labor Council here, uh, the Trades and Labor Congress of Canada, <laughs> but that's how it would be written in the uh, Labor Day with the LABOR in the, did we? No. It's not there. It, the original uh, image here, which you'll see later on, has it comes from the Toronto News, and it has Labor Day with an O. So, um, at some stage, I think in the 1940s and 50s, uh, the Canadian publishing publishing industry moved to the distinctive O U R. Um, anyway, they would get together to decide what to wear what they should bring along with them, whether to hire a band, whether they should have someone on a horse, whether they should have a float, and so on. And these would be huge debates. In a couple of the minute books I've gone through, not on Toronto, I will admit, this could be like five or six meetings of intense discussion, and then they would reverse themselves with what kind of hat they would wear, or whatever it would be. And of course, companies sold them products to do this. Not surprisingly, because so many other people were parading, there was lots of business for people who made banners and badges and all those other things that uh, were offered. This was from just from a Toronto newspaper that uh, uh, this ad appeared in. What they created, interestingly, was never meant to last. It was very ephemeral. It was just for that day. Much of it would, would be dismantled and thrown away and lost. And I, would, I was down at Labor Day, as you'll see in a few, uh, later to, tonight, uh, on, in September, and I realized how much of what I saw was going to be thrown away. It was just, just for that particular event. Um, and I, I would have come across reports of unions trying to find the banner they remember had they had a few years ago, and has anyone seen where it's gone, and such like. And also, much of it didn't uh, last very well. It was be made of products that were not intended to last. More interestingly, I think, is the question of how this was entirely neglected as a form of culture. What I'm describing to you is actually a set of cultural products and cultural performances that were folk culture, that actually had uh, considerable power were probably the most interesting and most widespread form of a collectively created working class culture that we had in the country. But no museums, no art galleries were interested in this. The only thing that survived has been uh, some of the buttons and badges and such like that you can find in antique markets, uh, because there's now a kind of nostalgia interest in all of this. But most of what I'm showing you, one of the reasons I'm focusing on pictures, is that the photographs and the drawings that were made at the time are just about all we have. It's the only way we really know, aside from the fact that newspapers put long descriptions of every parade on the front page every uh, Tuesday of late, uh, after Labor Day every year. So we do have a really good dis description of, of uh, what a lot of them looked like. Um, in the 1930s, things changed, and you'll see some really high-quality photographs. That's because the Globe and Mail had its first um, uh, staff photographer, and all of his negatives were given to the City of Toronto Archives, and, and there are just vast numbers of wonderful pictures that he took. So, why are they doing this? What are they hoping to get? When craft unions stepped out uh, onto Toronto streets, they wanted to do a number of things. First, they insisted on their respectability. So they borrowed all the trappings of the Main Street marching traditions, orderly marching with bands and so on, and marching in straight rows. There was very much a, a mimicking of the military model and the marching band that went with it. Secondly, they wanted to present the importance of their crafts and to encourage respect for them. And they used banners, again, to do that. This is one of the only pictures that we have, it's certainly the only one in Toronto that I've seen, where we can see, this is 1903, Fortunately, we can see that there. 
um, where these ladies have, we'd like to think they made it themselves, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. I think they got it from one of those companies, um, but they raised the money to donate this banner, which it is an attempt to show the machinist as a very po important figure in the, in the world of industry in this kind of heroic way that banners create, this, uh, create that kind of image. Um, they also, in addition to carrying the banners, oh, and this is, th this is an interesting change. This one still exists. Um, and it's, you can see that it's made of silk, very fragile. A whole collection of these were given to the Workers' Arts and Heritage Center, and they're, they're very hard to display because they're so <laughs> fragile. But you can see that the imagery has been reduced to letters and numbers. In the 20th century, you lose, until very recently, you lose all that lovely artwork that was there um, earlier on. Um, but each of the contingents would try and present themselves as a distinctive group and all wear the same outfits, often in some way or other mimicking or presenting boldly what their work was all about. So boilermakers carrying their tools. Bakers dressed not in the clothes they would have worn, but in sp spanking brand new outfits. The stone cutters with their, um, their uh, apron. The pattern makers who just got dressed up. <laughs> they would all have worn that identical outfit, however. The iron molders, again, identical, identical outfit, outfit. And the furriers who simply had an outfit that made them all look like they should be in the gay pride parade. <laughs> but every contingent would have 20, 50, 100 of, those, of people dressed identically. And if they didn't wear that, then they wore their best bib and tucker. You wore your most respectable clothes, and there would be discussions about what that would encourage. And at the bare minimum, you wore one of these badges. I was desperately trying to find it. I have images of badges, but not one of Toronto, so I didn't bring one. Um, but you can imagine, there are long ribbons with a, a clasp that, that goes on the front of them. And that would mark you off in one way or another. Sometimes it would also, be, in addition to that, you would wear a particular hat that you'd all decided on or carry a particular cane or whatever it might be. But the important thing is that you try to all look the same and look respectable. To establish the importance of your craft and to encourage respect for it. Now, one of the most remarkable things to me is that many of these parades had what the local newspapers called allegorical floats. I don't know why allegorical, except that each of them had a scene of work going on. Basically, craft workers would put on display on the back of a wagon the work that they did. So this, the blacksmiths were always there. They were always talking about uh, the noise the blacksmiths made. This was the blacksmiths in Toronto sometime in the 1890s. They would also have molders who would actually have a small foundry where they'd make little medallions and toss them out to the crowd. They'd have bakers baking little cookies or, or bits of bread, tossing them out to the crowd. One parade had a brewer, and people were walking quite closely behind him. <laughs> but they would have barbers shaving people. They would have all these people, that I could go on and on, we found so many different examples, um, trying to present their labor and to show just how valuable it was in a very dramatic display on the back of a wagon. And if you're a little kid, you're probably going to be impressed with that. If you're a middle-aged man, you're probably going to be impressed with that. But that also adds some of the glitz and interest to, to a parade and sets it apart from the more uh, traditional middle-class parades where you wouldn't have this unless the trades processions joined you. Unfortunately, th this is the only picture I have from Toronto of this. It's, uh, there were no photos that I've come across. Uh, we have many from other parts of the country. Um, but we do have excellent descriptions in the newspapers. We can find some later examples of this. This is from the 20s, when the uh, Canadian Electrical Trades Union is actually a city a branch of the city. And this is not during the parade. I rather imagine it would have had a bunch of men standing on it as it went down the street. And the um, waterworks department, similarly. <laughs> but you, the, you can see how there was a real attempt to present something about your job, right? Uh, the firemen were always a big hit. They would, and by the 1920s, their, their role was to provide some of the oldest fire equipment uh, around. But from the very beginning, uh, they, they would bring their bells and make a lot of noise and uh, be a uh, very big part of the show. So, to insist on their respectability first, secondly, to present the importance of their crafts, to encourage respect for them, but also to show their massed strength. One of the, this is not just labor in the abstract, this is organized labor. These are unionists. 
So he wanted to get out as large con uh, contingents as possible e from each occupational group. Believe it or not, these are plumbers. Um, and you want to remind your boss and the politicians that you uh, should be taken seriously in all sorts of uh, unsolved of ways. That's the same plumbers marching in very military formation in the 19, early 1930s, I think. And finally, you want to put your masculinity, your masculine identities on display, because part of what you're trying to show people is that you're a good breadwinner and that you work with your hands to make useful things. So it's a combination of those things that, that are bound up in what a working class man's sense of his masculine identity was all about. And that, of course, meant there wasn't much space for women. And as I said with the Orange Order, if women appeared, they should be in wagons or later in cars or trucks or floats off the street, not walking. And they should be carefully uh, shepherded along, as you notice, by a man driving the horse. There's no woman driving the horse. Um, these are not playground workers. This is one of the unusual contributions to a Toronto parade in 1915. But nonetheless, it's clear that these women would not have been allowed to walk on the street, uh, which was just too disreputable. Well, these parades were popular. People came out in their droves. This is, if you, go, if you Google Toronto Labor Day, you get this picture over and over and over again. It's almost the only one you get. It's Queen Street? Uh, Young Street. Young Street. Um, just above Shooter, I'm told. That's not Spadina? No. So, Oh, it's, it's not the fur companies of Spadina. This is much earlier than that. This is the turn of the century, uh, probably just after 1900. But you can see the parade is going to come right down the middle here of this crowd, and people have come in close, and they want to be able to see what's going on. Uh, clearly quite interested. Um, newspapers gave them a lot of coverage in, in anticipation of the parade, and after it happened, uh, Labor Day was taken very seriously as a civic event and welcomed, and there'd be... Uh, editorials about the wonders, wonders of labor, which usually didn't mean unions, but would mean how we all worked and so on. Um, and of course, in 1895, Toronto started the tradition of marching into the CNE, which was uh, a destination that large numbers of people would also be uh, waiting to watch uh, the, the uh, marchers come in. Well, this picture was probably from the 1920s or 30s. But by that point, all was not well for Labor Day and their paraders. Craft unions that had set all this in motion had been hammered by what I and other historians are taking to call the Second Industrial Revolution. Craft had been undermined, had been pushed back. Um, some nasty strikes had pushed them out, but also technological and managerial change had left them um, on the sidelines. And increasingly, they didn't have the energy, the people, or the resources to really put on much of a parade. And things began to slide down. Definitely by the 20s and 30s, labor was in decline. And it was in decline for another reason as well that had actually been there from the beginning. In 1896, the Labor Day uh, organizers in Toronto put out this, they often did, they put out what they call Labor Day souvenirs. And this image, a beautiful image in color, actually, I don't have the color version of it, uh, captures exactly the dilemma. Here is the figure of liberty that represents the labor movement that is trying to get this lazy lout and his kid up off the ground, right? <laughs> and after all, it's a day of rest. And that became the dynamic that they had to deal with. How are you going to convince people to get up and out and feel good about being part of the labor movement when actually, in fact, what they really wanted to do was relax <laughs> and to, to hold back? Um, Many, people, many workers just wanted to do their own thing. The labor movement organized games for families. Uh, it's often at the CNE or in another, another park. They all, all uh, began a baby contest. This is 1924, I think. I've always, always wondered why this uh, picture shows the father and not the mother. He didn't give birth, but uh, nonetheless, this was the winner of the baby contest that year. <laughs> But there were other commercial attractions to pull people away, including the CNE itself. Uh, clearly, this is, um, this is turn of the century. I've actually forgotten the date. But you're invited out to Hanlon's Point. Uh, you should definitely come to the exposition, the Toronto CNE, and do all the wonderful things that are available there, and many, many other things that are advertised, sporting events in particular. Um, also, you get the first glimmer of consumerism that appeared to get workers to think about buying a new suit for Labor Day. Uh, 
a Labor Day, or to enjoy some a glass or two of beer on Labor Day, or to buy mom some canned pork and beans so that she could have some time off on Labor Day. As more and more workers drifted off in search of their own private pleasures, parade organizers began to get worried about filling out the procession. It was going to look pretty skimpy. And so they began to add in more and more non-labor and more commercial elements. The city liked to use it to promote its own best interests, so here's the sanitation department. But then we find things like General Motors wanting to advertise its trucks. That's a postcard from, I think, the 1920s. But this one, now this one is amazing. This is 1933 in Tor Toronto. That is the Eden float. You know, the well-known pro-labor family, the Edens. <laughs> the year before, they had just broken a huge strike of garment workers. But inspiration, achievement, and labor, look at them, right? And at that point, you've got to wonder, what has this labor movement come to, that they're reduced to having to welcome one of the biggest labor haters in Toronto into their parade to put on? And incidentally, Edens would run ads in the newspaper, great big full-page ads, uh, saying how wonderful workers were with sy symbols of blue-collar workers and so on, never say the word union anywhere. It was all about the dignity of labor, the work we all do, you know, and such like that. Um, so, the, the tradition got up and going at the turn of the century and then began to decline. By the 1920s and 30s, it was arguably not in very good shape. Meanwhile, however, a different tradition of working class parading had emerged alongside and, and separate from those uh, Labor Day festivities, one that we might more likely call a demonstration. 1891, unemployed workers marching down Jarvis Street, of all places, which was a very posh street in those days, demanding work or bread. A group of uh, workers after the First World War in 1919. And of course, in the 1930s, parades of the unemployed that were trying to get uh, better treatment and uh, better access to work and wages. Workers in these parades use this, the conventions of orderly parading to agitate for some political goal, some change in public policy, rather than just celebrating. And that, was, that is a segue to a, an entirely new form of parading, which took, began to emerge in the 1920s. And that's the May Day Parade. Ironically, the craft union movement of the 1880s that had set Labor Day in motion had also launched another form of mass protest. It was in 1886 that the American Federation of Labor actually called on workers all over North America to walk out of their of work and demand the eight-hour day. And for several years after that, AFL unions celebrated both Labor Day, which was a holiday, and May Day, which was supposed to be a protest. Now, a couple of things happened along the road. Oh, the first thing I should say is, Almost every member of the labor movement I've encountered who, wants to, who thinks they know something about labor history assumes that this story is really that Labor Day was invented by a bunch of capitalists who wanted to suppress May Day. And that's not true. What I've just told you is the true story. And in fact, they both came out of the same nucleus, but then they di diverge. And it starts because in 1890, the socialists in Europe pick up on May Day and turn it into... Uh, a very serious anti-capitalist socialist festival. And they never adopt Labor Day at all. And increasingly, the American Federation of Labor got more and more nervous about this, and they pulled away from any May Day activities because they didn't like socialists. And so then there's a split that emerges by the turn of the century that would become very intense after the turn of the century in, North, uh, in the United States. So a right-left split happens, but it doesn't start out at the beginning. It's not there at the, uh, at the outset. Um, the first May Day parade in Canada actually happened in Montreal in 1906, but Toronto didn't um, get uh, much action until the 1920s. And they were organized, whoops, uh, this that slide, that was for the, uh, the American Federation of Labor. Um, they were organized, the May Day parades were organized primarily by the Communist Party. And they were seen as a festival of anti-capitalism and the celebration of socialism as an alternative to capitalism. Um, the message was radical, and it was quite a different approach to, to, de to delivering a message than you would have seen with the uh, May Day marchers, or with the Labor Day marchers. In form, they were somewhat like the older parades. 
They were orderly lines of marchers. They invariably dressed respectably in shirts and ties and, and proper dresses. A lot of the women are wearing furs and uh, very properly dressed. Um, but none of the, tr the old trappings of, of uh, sashes and ribbons and uh, special costumes and so on that had been so important in the old craft tr tradition. Now they were much simpler banners that suggested, uh, you can see the respectability there quite clearly, that suggested uh, a straightforward message, usually on a sign or a, or a simple banner. They integrated into their marches, unlike the craft unions, a wide variety of, of different kinds of workers from different stages of their lives and different experiences. Unemployed workers were welcomed. Ethnic groups of uh, various sorts uh, who identified with the, uh, the left were welcomed. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, unions under left-wing uh, leadership, particularly the clothing unions and the fur workers, were, were welcomed. And they also made room for women, sometimes marching as mothers, but very often uh, in some way present, presenting themselves as real workers. In this case, a group of, of strikers from Ontario Silknet, um, which is the United Textile Workers of America. And most interestingly, children. They integrated children quite fully in, in uh, and interestingly. Fight for free hot lunches in school, no wage cut for our teachers. As I was um, carving these bits out to show you, I was thinking, these, we could have these now. <laughs> Rob Ford's Toronto. <laughs> and many of them took the day off school. Um, so they, really, they wanted it as a real holiday. These are some of these photographs by this, the uh, Globe and Mail photographer, which are really, because they're original negatives, they're really clear, and you actually get such a good sense of the, of the people. These were not welcomed by civic authorities the way Labor Day had been. Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> I'm running way over time. Um, the police intervened quite often to try and, and uh, suppress them in the, in the late 20s and early 30s. This is, if they just, this is where they're seizing a banner they didn't like. Yet these parades were very popular. Lots and thousands of people came out to them. Um, in the second half of the 1930s in particular, when they actually vied with Labor Day for uh, popularity. But May Day took a nosedive in the 1940s for a couple of reasons. First, the war forced the Communist Party through some very convoluted twists and turns where they first supported Hitler and then opposed him. And then, more importantly, the Cold War set in in the later part of the 40s and put a real damper on um, a great deal of uh, left-wing thought and activity. So the parades continued on into the 50s, but they really shrank and they, their impact was much, much smaller. Meanwhile, something else was happening that is uh, equally and, and uh, certainly extremely interesting. That, that pulled out some of what uh, had been happening in the May Day parades. By World War II, there's a new wave of organizing going on in Toronto, as there is all across the country union organizing. And by the end of the war, plenty of strikes had erupted to make sure that there weren't going to be any more uh, huge layoffs and, and rollbacks like there'd been at the end of the First World War. A lot of the momentum came from industrial unions um, that wanted to unite all workers in a workplace into a single union rather than just the practitioners of a specific craft. Um, initially gathered together in the All-Canadian Congress of Labor, but then becoming the Canadian Congress of Labor. In fact, there were two separate houses of labor, one industrial, one craft, and they had two separate Labor Day parades from about 1940 on until 1956 when they merged again. So a new kind of Labor Day parade is born at this point, which contains as much anger as celebration, and which had many other new elements. During the war, floats, Union floats picked up on the theme of wartime propaganda to promote their own struggles for social justice, freedom, justice, cooperation, and so on. Um, it was also clear they wanted spectators to respect them as workers, but they couldn't put a whole meatpacking plant or a whole uh, rubber making factory on the back of a truck the way a blacksmith had been able to a few decades back. So what they did was put a lot more emphasis on the product and the company. So these floats would have, could have an angry edge at the same time as they're presenting how wonderful Goodyear tires were or industrial paints. They were also more ready to raise some more blunt, big social political issues. 
including unemployment. And note again the respectability. People are very, the men are very well dressed in their best suit, shirt and tie. And you'll see the contrast when we get a little further along. They were ready to take hold of some of the imagery that up till now had been associated with May Day, particularly the capitalist in a top hat. This is 1946, and the parade included three stock figures of the rich, insensitive politicians. In this case, it's Donald Gordon, who's chair of the Wartime Price and Trades Board, C.D. Howe, who's Minister of Munitions, and Humphrey Mitchell, who's the Minister of Labor. And they're all <laughs> accused of holding back workers' labor. But the image of the, the capitalist is repeated the next year and many other times as the insensitive fat cat with the top hat and so on, the kind you see on the Monopoly box, right? When you're playing a Monopoly game. But in this case, it's added, added in the, the image of the jail, where, in fact, members of the Canadian Seamen's Union were uh, spending time as a result of a major struggle on the waterfront. Um, these parade, parades, parades also tried to be more inclusive. They denounced open discrimin openly denounced racial discrimination and made efforts to gradually integrate more multicultural and slightly less white versions of humanity. Now, there aren't very many people of color in that picture, but the, the UAW uh, float 1952 at Massey Harris, Massey Ferguson, Massey Harris at that point, um, was trying to show ethnic diversity as a good thing in the banner over the top of the big thing over the globe is trying to make that point. They've at least inclu included an Asian. Uh, they won for the, best, for the best float that year in the parade. And then in 1956, finally, the all-black union, the sleeping car porters, get a chance to march in the parade for the first time. And in 1960, the Italian construction workers who had exploded in, in a series of strikes at that point uh, join the parade for the first time and bring in a whole new group of workers that had not had much of a role in, in the parades up to this point either. But of course, there are still some ugly stereotypes that hang on. Innocent children dressed in Hollywood Indians, still perpetuating myths about Aboriginal people. Cowboys and Indians were a big theme on television at this point, so you'd find this running through parades across the country. Perhaps the most interesting and complex new development, however, was the way that women were integrated into these parades. A few, in a few cases, they could come as auxiliaries. This is a pretty fancy one for the transit union, uh, women's auxiliary. But during the war, women got a chance to present themselves as real wage earners, wearing the a version of the uniform they wore in the factories. And remember, lots and lots of women are being integrated. And what's most interesting about this picture is they're actually not only marching in the street, but they're mimicking the military mode of marching that the men used at the same time. Uh, during the war, it's not entirely surprising. Um, but this is not a particularly traditional feminine view. They are, in this case, still up on the, on the floats, but they're presented in anything but normal feminine garb, Dominion Bridge. Increasingly, however, after the war, they began to be presented much more as pretty sexual objects in skimpy clothing, starting with, uh, oops, that's one, uh, one more. Oh, two more. This is, after the war again, a, a group of textile workers. But then we get the skimpy clothing. Um, starting with the drum majorettes, and then continuing on many union floats. It was not enough to just put women on the float, but you had to make sure they were wearing the short, shortest possible skirts. And fashions in the 1950s did not have shirts, skirts that short. This is just for presentation here. Um, they were used to celebrate the, uh, the wonders of the, the fur industry on Spadina, but they also had to be pretty good looking and their hair had to be done up pretty well. This is, Nupsi is the predecessor to QP, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, one of the predecessors. This woman may have been a secretary, but this is hardly the image of a secretary you would normally expect, <laughs> right? But this one. 1961, as I recall, this is the uh, pr Allied printing trades, which essentially have no women in their ranks whatsoever. This is purely a bauble on their float. And it's something to, to uh, titillate as they pass through the neighborhoods. And of course, a number of unions by this point are holding beauty contests. I've begun to think that although the labor movements, uh, uh, the women in the labor movement had for, for decades been talking about bread and roses, I think we're really talking about cheesecake and daffodils. <laughs> 
and in this uh, in this era. Labor didn't invent this sexist imagery. The whole of North America culture was saturated with it in advertising and television and every other parade that was held in the period. But labor didn't challenge it either, not in this period. There were a few other surprising changes in the look of Labor Day parades, mostly drawn from colorful new, uh, the colorful new inspiration of other parades that had started to appear in the first half of the 20th century. Santa Claus Parade had brought some very interesting new elements that were more fanciful, that sometimes drew on popular culture, like Felix the Cat, and that, uh, introduced, that made parading a quite different kind of experience, that drew to some extent on circus parade activity, but certainly made parades a very different sort of thing, to, and dip, set different expectations for what a parade should do. That also flowed over into the Grey Cup parades, where the, obviously the cowboy influence was there, but that had also begun to appear in lots and lots of parades. And of course, everywhere, the clown appeared. All the parades had to have clowns. And so, labor started to have clowns. Lots and lots and lots of them in their parades. Some people thought that was frivolous and detracted from labor's message. But in another way to look at it, they were drawing on the new parading traditions with a sprinkling of clowns and cowboys and beauty queens to make a public good spectacle that would draw a lot of attention to their other messages which just along the row they were making in the same parades. Messages that said, we need Medicare, we need better pensions, or we need to get Medicare before we're all skeletons. Um, so whatever your take on the new, these new developments, there was no doubt that by the 1960s and 70s, the parade had changed, but that uh, unions were having trouble getting their members to march through the streets. And there were several, several reasons for this. The cities were changing. They weren't small and compact and full of walking people. They were huge. Suburbs had uh, been attached, and people were far strewn out. And one of the most frustrating things must have been to um, walk through empty streets as a parader on a weekend day. Um, still is. Mass communication had changed. There were other ways to communicate, and broadcasting being the most important. But labor was also a victim of its own success. It had fought for shorter hours, the 40-hour work week, the creation of a two-day weekend, and then the long weekend, paid vacations, summer being a very intense time for having holidays. And so Labor Day became a time to get away. And in fact, it became a, uh, less of a labor-oriented event than a, whoops, oh, I jumped ahead of myself. Of course, uh, the, the biggest parade people had to expose themselves to was the Highway 400 traffic jams. <laughs> But it became associated with the end of summer, which Stephen mentioned at the beginning, in ways that children became quite uh, uh, focused, uh, quite uh, conscious of. Um, if you didn't escape the city on the weekend to go somewhere else, the chances were pretty good that you focused on work, work around the home, and there were advertisers increasingly telling you to come on over and look at our goods because we can help you. Each of them saying, isn't labor wonderful, but by the way, come and buy our products. In many cities, labor movements decided to quietly cancel the parades and concentrate on picnics, but not Toronto. And in fact, this annual event got revitalized in the city in the 1970s with a new surgence of militancy. And that came from the new conditions of, of uh, the treatment of labor that happened in the 1970s. Governments introduced policies that seemed to attack and undermine notably wage and price controls, um, that were introduced in 1975. I'm pretty sure this is a reference to the uh, wage, the uh, six and five wage controls that were brought in in Ontario a few years later in 1982. Um, parades got more serious and they shed their clowns and their beauty queens and they got more political. A lot of the energy came from new public sector workers like the Ontario Public Service Employees Union and there was incredible new energy coming from the women's movement which was not only joining the parades as workers, but they had created their own parade, International Women's Day, starting in the 1970s, in which unions would regularly participate, so there was a kind of cross-fertilization between parading cultures going on. The interest in the International Women's Day also included some library workers um, and their union. The biggest labor protests that hit this city ever, and throughout time and since, was in 1996 when roughly a quarter of a million people marched on Queen's Park to protest the new right-wing turn, turn of the Harris Conservative government uh, that the Harris Conservative government had made in Ontario by weakening labor legislation and cutting social programs. 
Um, I've never seen this aerial shot until this week, but it's quite there. You can begin to see why people were counting up in the hundreds of thousands. There were a lot of people there. This was, of course, one of 11 actions in 11 different cities across Ontario between 95 and 98. <coughs> in many ways, the spirit of that huge demonstration continues on in the labor parades of the early 2000s, uh, including one that just happened a few weeks ago. This one's from 2005, but it does highlight one of the, the challenges of labor of trying to, to organize new sectors that have grown into great importance as some old industrial sectors have declined, especially in Toronto. Visually, things look different than they once did. People dress more casually, though often with the same t with all wearing the same t-shirt and baseball cap. They don't march in tight military formation anymore. There are still some of the of uh, there are still some banners, I thought. Oh yeah. There are still some traditional banners as well as some new ones. Um, these tend to be more in the buildings trades. Uh, but also some more mass-produced signs and, and many color, but it's a real preference for flags, I've noticed. And there are floats of various kinds, though they generally are simpler than they used to be, and certainly no one tries to show their job being performed on the back of a float. But the faces look different. Many more people of color, reflecting how Toronto has changed over the last half century. You'll find healthcare workers, teachers, nurses, those are the teachers. The last ones were the nurses. <laughs> Hotel employees. Librarians. <laughs> and you'll still find a few clowns, though not very many. And you'll find, still find lots of kids. But also thousands of people who share this woman's commitment and her willingness to get out on the street to deliver a message, just the way those first labor paraders did a century and a half ago. But, <laughs> You've been listening to a recording of Craig Heron's talk, Labor on the March, 150 Years of Labor Parades in Toronto. It is part of the 2011 History Matters Lecture Series sponsored by the Toronto Public Library and the History Education Network. Please check back on activehistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the 2011 History Matters Lecture Series.